Welcome to Ideas Sunday. It's June 30th, 2019. Half a century ago, humans first set foot on a celestial body not our own. And it happened to be our man from Wapakoneta, Ohio, Neil Armstrong. We visit a hero's hometown in Northwest Ohio. Metro Health delivers details on its planned main campus rebuild, which promises to transform the Clark Fulton neighborhood. It's time to make a difference. But beyond bricks and mortar, Dr. Boutros plans to overcome the root causes of poor health, including poverty. And as all-star fever grips area baseball fans, we meet the players of the Miracle League. This is amazing. It kind of makes the playing field level for everybody. Come along as these kids swing for the fences. Ideas Sunday is next. Brought to you by Westfield. Offering insurance to protect what's yours, grow your business, and achieve your dreams. Good morning, and welcome to Ideas Sunday on this last day of June. I'm Rick Jackson. Thank you so much for joining us. On May 25th of 1961, President John F. Kennedy challenged a joint session of Congress and the American people to meet an ambitious goal. Now it is time to take longer strides. Time for a great new American enterprise. Time for this nation to take a clearly leading role in space achievement, which in many ways may hold the key to our future on Earth. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space. Eight years later, more than 600 million people around the world watched as three Americans, Michael Collins, Buzz Aldrin, and Neil Armstrong, attempted just that, departing NASA's Kennedy Space Center aboard the Apollo 11 spacecraft. Then, on July 20, 1969, 109 hours into the daring 250,000-mile journey, Commander Armstrong became the first human to step foot on the moon, narrating his climb down from the lunar lander with these now-famous words. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Next month marks 50 years since that milestone, and perhaps no place will commemorate it with more pride than Wapakoneta, Ohio, astronaut Neil Armstrong's hometown. Ahead of the golden anniversary of his one small step, we traveled to the Agles County seat to learn more about the late Neil Armstrong's roots and to see what's transpired since the town was vaulted into the spotlight by his vault onto the lunar surface. Three, two, one, zero, all engine running. Liftoff, we have a liftoff, 32 minutes past the hour, liftoff on Apollo 11. So began the adventure that engraved Neil Armstrong's name into America's history books. His was the stoic face of a project into which America had invested $20 billion and the efforts of nearly a half million people. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here, the Eagle has landed. But it was likely from the back bedroom of this house at the corner of Buchanan and West Benton Streets in Wapakoneta, Ohio, that Neil the Boy made balsa wood airplanes and may have first pondered the moon a quarter century before Neil the Man touched its surface. He was an extraordinary individual. Um, he was so completely in, 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 enthralled and involved with anything that he did. Uh, and, and, and he thought so with such depth. George Dudley Schuler moved to Wapakoneta about 80 years ago, then a town of only 5,000 people. He attended high school and joined a Boy Scout troop with Neil Armstrong, a friendship maintained for life. Dudley probably has the longest connection to the astronaut, but it seems everybody in Wapak, as they call it here, has an Armstrong story and a fierce pride about him being theirs. Here in Wapakoneta, we are very excited about the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11 being the hometown of Neil Armstrong. It's something that we celebrate every year, but the 50th anniversary, we are celebrating in a very big way. Expectations are that 50,000 people from around the world will pack this town on July 20th, five times its population. NASA television will base one of its four live commemorative broadcasts here. 
At least five past and current astronauts, several with Ohio connections, will be in town. There will be reunions of all sorts that date back to 69, and that summer Sunday when so many of us were gathered around fuzzy black and white TV sets. But this event isn't something the town threw together just to capitalize on the anniversary. In many ways, Wapakoneta is a time capsule, remembering a different America, a main street of small shops, antique stores and eateries, century homes and century businesses, historic civic structures. There's even a 115-year-old movie theater showing just one feature per day. The Hollywood biopic First Man about Neil Armstrong had its red carpet opening there last year. Because of the space connection, streets there bear names like Apollo, Saturn, and Lunar. It's a spot where the present coexists with a more serene past. We have a lot of the original fabric, and that, again, ties into this whole Armstrong story that uh, it's not an abstract connection we have to Neil Armstrong. We can show you where he was born. We can show you his boyhood home, where he went to school, where he worked uh, after school to earn money for his flight lessons. Flight lessons that took place in this airplane. Yes, they preserved the two-seat Aranka Champ as well, the first of more than 200 types of aircraft Armstrong eventually piloted. Another plane, a NASA experimental jet of which only four were produced, sits outside. They are just two of the showpieces at the Neil Armstrong Air and Space Museum, commissioned by an edict from then-Ohio Governor Jim Rhodes while Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin were still on the lunar surface during the Apollo 11 mission. It was built in honor of Neil Armstrong and all Ohioans who've attempted to defy gravity. So the, the point was, was it was just Neil go, not going to the moon, but it was all Ohioans and actually all Americans who helped put the first man on the moon. This is a museum show place for the world to come here and see the, the hometown and the accomplishments of, of Neil Armstrong. The museum is Wapakoneta's centerpiece, though it sits on the outskirts of this small town where travelers on I-75 can catch a glimpse. Funding the museum was a challenge. The governor telling people here to raise $500,000, which the state would match. Locals eagerly did so, and the museum opened just three years later to the day of the moon landing, featuring artifacts ranging from high school yearbooks with Armstrong prominent in them to newspapers from around the world commemorating the historic landing, to astronaut suits he wore in space and practiced in on Earth, to the actual Gemini 8 spacecraft Armstrong rescued when a malfunction in orbit nearly killed him and pilot David Scott. Even if they may not know it's there when it kind of hits them and they realize, you know, cause people, that this really went into space? Yeah, this really went into space. This was, especially with first man, you could say you saw first man. We have serious problems. But that's the scene. Perhaps topped only by a rock. A rock Armstrong brought home from the moon. Neil Armstrong, I, he was the astronaut I was fascinated with. I, I don't know just about his family and his, his wife and kids and just the whole, everything about Neil was my thing. Lakita Brewster and 12-year-old son Dallas are those typical didn't know this was here visitors who spotted the museum while passing by. Turns out they're huge space flight fans from Tennessee changed their plans and spent the night in town to see all they could, and they loved learning more about Armstrong. Even visited that home where he was raised, Eagle's Landing. Some friends of mine were visiting, and we were talking, and one of them said, you know, we ought to come up with a name for this house. And, um, of course, the name Eagle's Nest came up, and I said, absolutely not. It's not going to be called Eagle's Nest. Karen Tullis lives in the Armstrong house now. Amazingly, she bought it 30 years ago without knowing it had been home to Uglades County's most famous resident. Then we came up with Eagle's Landing, and that's how the house got its name. A former school teacher here and around Western Ohio, she loved having history at her fingertips and talks to visitors outside the house nearly every day, reinforcing the idea of Armstrong as salt of the earth. I didn't do it for glory, and if you know anything about Neil, some people call him a recluse. Some people get upset because he didn't come back home as often as they thought he should. But he didn't do it for the glory. He did it because this is what he was called to do. Like most here, she looks forward to recreating this, the Bob Hope hosted Parade of the Century in Wapak when Armstrong came home and cemented the town's place on the map. The 69 parade was Wapak's gold standard, the parade by which all other parades are measured as it traveled south down Auglaize Street here. The committee putting together the 50th says the goal is to make this parade every bit as big and every bit as memorable.
We have committees that have been working for over two years on this festival and many activities leading up to the anniversary date that we've been offering uh, to the community. Um, and then we'll ramp up to the 10 day celebration, which will bring in people from outside of the community to celebrate with us. That was a goal of our 2019 celebration committee to bring as many people around the table as we could and reflect as many uh, themes to for people to plug into. I'm not a space geek, so you know what am I going to be interested in? Maybe the music of the 60s or the movies of the 60s. Other people might be interested in the fashions of the 60s. We also like to share the stories um, from his career and, and other Ohio astronauts and and what the future might bring because. We're at the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing, and that 50th anniversary is that pivot point. Um, it's the last big significant anniversary of an event where most of the people who experienced it or participated in it are, are gonna be around. That's just how it is. As the day nears and the excitement builds, the memories flood in. 50 years, a man on the moon, 50 years ago, you'd never seen anything or thought of that. We would put a man on the moon for a while, and we did. And it happened to be our man from Wapakoneta, Ohio, Neil Armstrong. You knew him. I knew him, yes. Excitement for a man who lived an exciting life, yet shunned the accompanying spotlight. And for that, Neil Armstrong is honored as well. One of his concerns was the fact that some people thought that he, this museum belonged to him, and it didn't. And that goes back to the whole idea of the moon landing. And when he talked about going to the moon, uh, it was just not him up there. There was an awful lot of other people who were involved to put him on the moon. The moon comes up in this direction and goes over the house. And I can lay in bed and watch the moon come up. And like all people from Wapakoneta, we wink at the moon. Wapakoneta celebrations begin July 12th. We'll have links to more information at ideastream.org slash ideas now. PBS is marking the moon landing anniversary with a three-part American Experience documentary titled Chasing the Moon. The program premieres a week from tomorrow, Monday, July 8th at 9 p.m. The series features never-before-seen archival footage and diverse voices you've never heard, including the first woman to serve in NASA's Mission Control Center. Here's a preview of Chasing the Moon. Capcom, we're go for landing. Zero, one, eight, eight, nine. Altitude 27,000 feet. 1201, Roger, 1201 alarm. Who's touch and go? They have 70 seconds in which to redesignate the landing site. They were running low on fuel. The computer was overloading. That's the first time I understood what it meant to smell fear. The urge to explore goes back to our earliest days as Homo sapiens. This is the beginning of the most audacious undertaking that man has ever attempted. The Soviet program has definitely more momentum than ours. They had the first woman in orbit, the first multiple crew, the first spacewalk. And now the Russians are talking about shooting up something that will hit the moon. It sparked a political response. Well, you have just witnessed a severe propaganda defeat for this country. The president wanted to do something astounding to the world. It will be the greatest and most complex exploration in man's history. By May, he's already having second thoughts. I don't know why we should be spending this kind of money because I'm not that interested in space. Twenty billion dollars to put a man on the moon. There were problems all the way along. We were fixing arrows very close to flight time. My feeling was they were flying with bailing wire and rubber bands. There's always a possibility of catastrophic failure, of course. They died at T-minus 10 minutes, helplessly trapped inside their spacecraft. 
The fire shattered my wife's confidence in NASA and in the Apollo program. It was just a time when it, we were in shock. A 29-year-old Negro says he's anxious to go into space. After I successfully finished the program, the White House announced we now have a black astronaut. I was convinced I was in the club. One of the joys about the space program, everybody felt they had a piece of it, and they did. Okay, now we can see you coming down the ladder now. The serpent appears to be almost like a powder. Magnificent sight out here. Yeah, you know, this is Houston, we're copying. We needed something like that to really challenge this country. This was not a yellow brick road from Cape Canaveral to the moon. It was a hard, March. Two minutes, 51 seconds into the mission. Burning through his way. Right on my money. It was a historical milestone, and it was of importance to the people of the world. By golly, we, mankind, did this thing, and we're all brothers together. Where were you in 1997? President Bill Clinton occupied the White House, Titanic and Men in Black topped the box office, and Tiger Woods became the youngest golfer to win the Masters. 1997 was also the most recent time that Cleveland hosted Major League Baseball's All-Star Game. Three players represented the Indians on the roster that July, outfielder David Justice, first baseman Jim Tomey, and catcher Sandy Alomar. With the score tied 1-1, bottom of the seventh inning, Alomar blasted a game-winning two-run homer. He became the first player to win the All-Star MVP award in his home ballpark. Ahead of the Midsummer Classic's return to the corner of Ontario and Carnegie next month, Ideastream's Glenn Forbes caught up with Alomar, who's still wearing an Indian's uniform, now serving as the team's first base coach. All right, Sandy, let's start with this year's club uh, playing their best stretch mm -hmm. of baseball. What do you see as the difference now as opposed to maybe a month ago? Uh, better fundamentals, better approach at the plate. Uh, our pitching has given us the chance throughout the year to stay in the game. But you just can't count only on pitching alone. You have to score some runs, and uh, guys were like not swinging it back the proper way, I, I felt. I think they had wrong approaches. Everybody was pulling everything, trying to hit home runs. But I think like uh, a month ago, they, they started to hit the ball the middle of the other way, be able to cover away and not and just, and just take what the pitcher's giving you. So they, their approach has changed dramatically and that really is paying off. What do you enjoy the most about coaching? And when you were playing, did you always think you'd end up being a coach? When I was playing and I, be, I became, you know, I, I was in the injury list a lot, and I, I, plenty. So well, you get to reflect a lot and you get to see the game different way. So I felt like uh, a lot of people say, hey, when you stop playing, you probably could be a coach because you can identify many things right away. But uh, I, I enjoy teaching. I enjoy uh, breaking down opposition pitchers and catchers and also kind of bring that to the table to our team. Uh, our, our team, uh, our guys are very athletic and uh, kind of perform better if they, ha if they have a better idea and understanding what everybody else is do uh, will do to them. So I, I enjoy co uh, coaching to me is, is a passion and uh, I started doing that when I was a player. Not even specific to the All-Star game. I mean, 1997 was such an incredible year. When I say 1997, what runs through your head? Well, many great memories. I mean, 1997, by any means, we didn't start great in the season. Regular season, we were like kind of hovering around 500, five games over, six games over, but we were not, we didn't hit a stretch until Gene Tommy's birthday. Until we celebrated Gene Tommy's birthday, we all pulled our socks up and uh, we had a meeting in the locker room and say, hey, you know, guys, we are too talented to play the baseball the way we are. We took off after that uh, and uh, we became a unit and a team and and trust me, 97 team was, was loaded with good players, but we, we were underachieving. So 
Uh, a lot of things go through my mind, you know, the All-Star game, the Jim Tomey birthday that we, we started taking off, uh, and all the playoff experience was fantastic. I, I felt like uh, beating the Yankees uh, in the first series was, uh, it was almost like a war series. You hit two famous home runs in 1997, one in the All-Star game and one against the Yankees, the series you just mentioned. Take me through those. What do you remember about those? Well, the All-Star game, on, I, I, you know, you, you don't come to the All-Star game expecting you're going to be in the MVP. You come here to, especially in your, in your home ballpark, I came here to enjoy this with my family and uh, our, uh, our community. And I was having a heck of a time. I also had my son on the field in the home run derby. It was a lot of fun. Uh, the, the, uh, the fact that I had an opportunity to win the game, it was just like, it was just second to none. I, I went out there and I was so anxious at the, the first two swings that I had that I had to calm myself down. And, and I just, like I say, have a better approach and hit the ball up the middle, just try to drive that guy for second base and I end up hitting a home run. So sometimes you, you try to do minimal things and you end up something, doing something big. Uh, the home run against uh, Rivera, that was huge because I, this is the first, it's the first time in a playoff that I had an approach and that approach paid off perfectly because I, he throws a lot of cutters and we just basically focus in this particular window where I'm going to swing the bat and he threw the ball right there. So as a player, you're running up uh, right to that Sunday, you know, two days before the All-Star game, you're focused on playing the games. As a coach, same thing, you're focused on the games, but do you notice any differences in the preparation between 1997 and 2019? Anything different? Well, it's, it's totally different because I, I was like, I was a player then, now I'm a coach. Uh, my, my responsibilities are totally different now. So I'm more focused on what, how, how can I get my players better in my department? And, and uh, then I was just focusing on, okay, how am I going to prep myself for the All-Star game and not having a break? So this is completely different, uh, you know, views of uh, when you are players and when you are uh, a coach. But uh, I'm definitely going to enjoy both. Does the event seem bigger now? Does the All-Star game and the week, the weekend, does that seem bigger now? Absolutely, absolutely. It's a lot, it's a lot bigger, but in the past, you got more people coming in right away because there was no, so much social media. You know, now there's social media, people really like, Everything is just so prepared in the social media that uh, it has become uh, this magnitude of events. So you got the red carpet, we didn't have that then. Uh, that'd be kind of interesting, mm. by the way, see how everybody comes in. And I think it's going to be in center field, the red carpet, which is a perfect spot, perfect location for the stadium. They have the Gene Tomey statue right there also. You, recently, you were named Grand Marshal of the All-Star Game Parade. Did they tell you what does that mean? What does that entail? What <laughs> do you do? I just, I just take it out. I, let, 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 I take it like, let's get the party started. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to bring everybody in. It's me and uh, Gene Tomey, I believe. Uh, just it's the Grand Parade, the red carpet that we're going to come in Grand Marshal. Uh, our, our squads, so uh, it means a lot. I mean, I, I'm I'm uh, I'm honored to be named an ambassador, one of the ambassador of the All Star Game, and Grand Marshal even better. Certainly, uh, you mentioned Jim Tomey. There will be some other uh, former teammates in town. Do you look at this almost as like a reunion for you guys? Oh yes, uh, we we stay in contact. A lot of those guys come over. Uh, you got uh, Jimmy, Kenny Lofton, uh, Mike Hargrove, our manager, and. Uh, there's going to be many guys that I play with. Some of those guys come through the season uh, once in a while. Other guys come to spring training. So uh, it's going to be like a, a mini reunion. Your daughter will be singing the national mm -hmm. anthem before the Futures game. Mm -hmm. Does that make it feel almost like full circle? I mean, what are the emotions associated <laughs> yeah. with that? Uh, she's done a fantastic job with, uh, with, uh, with her career. So uh, she's going to be singing the uh, national anthem in uh, Futures game. And then she's going to stick around for the other festivities uh, that we're going to enjoy with the family. So it's, it's a first circle. Also, my son is going to be here also, which is uh, he received the trophy in 1997 when uh, I was named the MVP. So they, they you know, they, they, they're going to enjoy it. They, they're here for the festivities also. I got to sneak this in, too. We know you're a big bike rider. Mm -hmm. Do you go through, what are your favorite spots in Cleveland to bike? Do you go through the Metro Parks? Uh, tell our <coughs> audience what, what you do with that. Yeah, Metro Parks are, are, are great. You know, like uh, it's known for uh, a lot of cyclists going in there. So people are more careful there when they drive. Uh, I, I go there. I go to the towpath. I ride in Lake Road, uh, all, all on the west side. But uh, this year I haven't ridden that much. I've been pretty much uh, kind of in-house uh, riding on a virtual trainer because of certain situations and time. But uh, I, I, enjoy, I enjoy cycling, especially here in Cleveland. It's, uh, the community is great and there's a lot of riders out there. 
Sandy Alomar, 1997 All-Star Game MVP and Ambassador and Grand Marshal for the 2019 All-Star Game here in Cleveland. Thanks so much for the time. Oh, thank you, guys. Appreciate it. A new transportation plan spearheaded by the Northeast Ohio Area-Wide Coordinating Agency aims to cut traffic deaths in half by the year 2040. So how can the streets be made safer for everyone? A jury in Lorain County decided this month that Oberlin College libeled a local bakery and should pay $44 million in compensatory and punitive damages. Is the verdict a win for the little guy or a blow to free speech? And behind every opioid death is a story. A new book looks to put human faces on the numbers and break down stigma that may keep those impacted by the epidemic silent. Those are some of the topics discussed this past week on The Sound of Ideas. So we have areas of emphasis that, let's use intersections as an example. Um, the highest crash intersection that we have um, in the region is East 55th Woodland Kinsman, that intersection, uh, where over the last five years there have been 290 crashes. However, the deadliest um, is not necessarily that cor that uh, intersection. When you look at which one is the deadliest, which is the number of fatalities, we are looking at Clark and West 25th and St. Clair and East 105th, which each one of those have had six fatalities over the last five years. The college's role is in all protests, and really the college has an obligation to maintain a certain sense of lawful behavior and order and a representative of the college is required to be at pro student protests and demonstrations to ensure that lawful behavior. And that's without respect to the content of the actual protest or demonstration. So the college's presence there is to be an intermediary buying between the students and law enforcement and an intermediary buying between the students and whatever business or person or a facility uh, that they are protesting against. When the students see their vice president, dean of students, with a bullhorn passing out the flyer and other administrators passing out the flyer, what do they think? You know, it, it perpetuates, it supports, it promotes uh, this conduct. We saw, you know, the college response was, no, we don't really have that kind of control over the students. But then we saw emails and texts talking about um, the dean of students saying, She'd like to unleash the students, unleash the students, and that they would rain fire and brimstone down upon this store. They certainly understood the control and the power and the influence that they had in this community. We really want the state to learn something real from this. Um, it's very tempting to watch the numbers go down and then to get back to our lives as they were before. But I think what you, you see with this is that this is not just about addiction. This is not just about um, pills or something like that. This is about all sorts of much deeper social structures. And tomorrow on The Sound of Ideas, a look at the crowded Democratic field in the wake of the first debates. Talk to you tomorrow. You're watching Ideas Sunday. Thanks for spending part of your morning with us. Still to come, while Progressive Field prepares for the Major League Baseball All-Star Game, we head to another diamond to introduce you to the young athletes of Lake County's Miracle League. But first, 
Friday at the Metro Health System's annual stakeholders meeting, CEO Akram Boutros announced specific plans for the neighborhood transformation, promised as part of Metro's $1 billion rebuild of its main campus. To start, the public hospital system and its private partners will develop three buildings in the Clark Fulton neighborhood. They'll include more than 250 apartments targeted at a range of income levels, as well as space for retail and for offices. Metro's police force will go into one of the buildings, a way Boutros said to enhance security in the neighborhood. The partners hope to entice a grocery store into another space. They're also going to help employees to buy homes near the main campus, or if they already live there, to upgrade. Finally, and this goes beyond bricks and mortar, Metro is starting what it's calling an Institute for Hope, aimed at helping residents overcome the root causes of poor health, including poverty. IdeaStream's Joe Froelich sat down with Dr. Boutros last week to talk about Metro's bold new approach and about the difference between medical care, where Cleveland excels, and health care, where the results are often dismal. If you look at what I've done in the past six years here, I have not tried in any way to compete on the tertiary or quaternary uh, services that the clinic and UH uh, and, uh, provide. They do a great job with it. Okay. And, and there's no reason for us to, to duplicate it or to, to try to replace it, right? Our attention has been focused on what most of the healthcare system has not been done, which is on the better primary care and also ameliorating the illnesses before they start. So we've focused on providing healthcare in our schools, children in foster care who suffer from significant number of adverse childhood events, um, uh, patients who are um, suffer from addiction, mental health issues. That's not what uh, tertiary and quaternary organizations are, are known for. That's what we need to be able to provide better health health services for, wraparound services. You gave earlier this month a very uh, blunt speech at the City Club. In fact, you almost seem to say, you hope you offended some people to get them out of their, their comfort zones. And one of the things that you talked about in that was a concept called ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experiences. For, for, the, for the audience, what's the Reader's Digest version of what, of what ACEs means? Yeah, so, so a lot of people link ACEs with poverty. It is not true. It happens in um, um, Irish home, Hispanic homes, um, uh, white, uh, uh, African-American, it happens to the rich, it happens to the boor, poor. Montana has one of the highest, has the highest ACEs prevalence in the country. It's not Ohio, but Ohio is pretty much up there. So ACEs are, are, are these adverse childhood experiences in which a child feel, re, experiences um, physical, emotional, or, or uh, sexual abuse. Um, um, they um, um, have physical or emotional neglect. They have somebody who is in their home who is incarcerated, um, somebody in their home who is battling addiction or mental health, somebody, the product of a single family home. All of these have a significant impact. And if you have one ACE, it's not too, too problem. You have seven ACEs, you have six times the, the risk of things like COPD or cancers. So you're going to be screening all children for ACEs and even talking to adults about that. Yes. How's that going to change? How do you think that's going to change the delivery of healthcare system? And again, address those broader themes that you're talking about. One of the most um, infuriating things I used to hear as a practicing physician was that it's the patient's fault. Okay, so they're non-compliant. When you actually look at the reasons that most people are non-compliant, they're not stupid, self-destructive people who just say, I don't want to get better. I want to remain sick. And that's what we attribute when they say the patient is non-compliant. They're non-compliant for rational reasons. And they're non-compliant, typically we have, they have some significant obstacles that we need to help them with. All right, so, so for us, as we look into, into these uh, 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 services and programs, I'll give you an example. We looked at high cost me, uh, uh, patients who, have, who uh, spent with uh, one of the insurers over an average of over $50,000 a year. 
by connecting with them by telephone with social workers and, and nurses and, and their doctors over a period of time and dealing with their social determinants of health, we were able to reduce their cost by over 25% okay, in one year. I think if you keep doing that every year, the long-term impact will be over 25%. And they're healthier, they're more active with their grandchildren, they're better members of our community. So, so this idea of just focusing on advanced medical care is the reason we're here today. We have to do better in addressing the, 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 the social impediments to better health care. Let me go back to another thing you said in your, uh, in your city club speech. If we truly want this to be a great city, if we really want to help people become the best they can be, if we honestly care about our future, we must stop demonizing people who use drugs, who behave differently, are in jail, don't have a place to call home. The situation they find themselves in is often not the result of a moral failing. It's the result of an illness. And these illnesses are born of a society that has invested billions in medical care and little in health care. It's time we all did something to reverse that. Are you suggesting that maybe the way to really bend the curve is to not think so much about healthcare competition or drug prices so much as it's looking, maybe what we need to do is address these broader societal needs? Yeah, so this is not Akram Boutrous's views. This is the research that has been shown over and over and over again. And we've known this for over 20 years, and we're just, it is too lucrative for us to continue to provide um, uh, you know, specialized care services. And guess what? You as the public love us for it. You pat us on the back and you say, oh my God, you know how to do a whole body transplant? Oh, you are the best healthcare center around. We gotta start, st you know, we gotta start talking about, are you, want us to be a great medical delivery system? Or you want us to be a great health system? You've been giving us all the accolades for providing excellent medical care. Excellent medical care being provided in this country has resulted, and not addressing the social determinants of health, has, has, has resulted in the life expectancy going down every year for the past three years that we've, we have data for, and is expected to go down again in 2018. So it'll be four years in a row. At what point what does success look like, and how long do you think it takes to get there? And can you, can you handle the expense of trying to, to bridge yourself to this sort of new approach to delivering? We and the Board of Trustees believe we can handle the expense. We're making a, a minimum five-year commitment of tens of millions of dollars into our Institute for Hope, which is going to be the Institute for Health, Institute for Opportunity, Institute for Partnership, and Institute for Empowerment. We believe not only will we be able to make the investment, that the return on that investment by us for patients we are taking financial risk for is going to be multifold. 30% is what we expect to save in total healthcare dollars if we provide these services well. Well, at $10,000 and, and, and uh, average spending, that's $3,000 of savings. We're not going to be providing $3,000 of services to, to people to keep them healthy. I want to go back to, again, one more thing from the, uh, fr from the speech in terms of, I, I mentioned that you spoke very bluntly. What we have in Cuyahoga County is a black infant mortality crisis. African-American babies in Cuyahoga County die at four to six times the rate of white babies. When we speak of this as an infant mortality problem and ignore race, we cloud the issue. And if there is one thing we know about African-American infant mortality, infant mortality, it is due in part to structural racism. And so to be clear about the definition of this, it doesn't imply that people who work in healthcare are racist. Structural racism refers to the totality of ways in which societies foster racial discrimination through mutually reinforcing systems of housing, education, employment, earnings, benefits, credit, media, healthcare, and criminal justice. So I ask you, how can we solve a problem we're not being perfectly clear about? 
while ignoring one of its root causes. The deaths of our black children must stop. It is an atrocity. And we must acknowledge this, and to not to do so is a moral outrage. Again, very strong language. Um, maybe things we're not used to saying as a community. Was there a moment, perhaps a meeting you were in, where you just reached a point where I can't, I can't keep using the same euphemisms anymore? Yeah, so I, I uh, co-chair First Year Cleveland with Patty de Pompey from University Hospitals. And um, during, Patty wasn't there, uh, but we had decided we're going to uh, introduce First Year Cleveland to the community and all different agencies. And there were about 100 people there as, I'm, as, I'm, as they're asking me to talk about this. And I then began getting questions that were just a little bit strange. How are, where are we going to locate these? How is Beachwood going to get services? A lot of the areas that we have very low infant mortality issues. And I started thinking to myself, do people actually think we have a white infant mortality problems? Our white infant mortality is one of the lowest around. So I'm thinking to myself, d d I'm... I'm Am I missing something here? And I thought about it and I said, I said to myself, you know, it's time for me to do this. So I stood up and I said, look, structural racism is an issue in this community. It's an issue for a lot of different communities, urban cores. We must address it. And, and what I said to everybody who was supposed to become a member of this group, and I said, and if you do not believe structural racism has an impact on infant mortality in Cuyahoga County, get up and leave. Don't want to work with you. Not interested in having that discussion with you. If you want to, if you want to come and let us educate you about it, great. If you're going to say it's something that I'm not interested in, we're not going to participate in it. Anybody get up and leave? No. <laughs> it would have been very awkward if they did. <laughs> How much, though, of what you see your role over the next couple of years, though, maybe is making things feel awkward for people? I think that's what leadership is. Leadership, and, and I'm, not, I'm not trying to do, I am, this is not a role I want to play because I'm, I'm, I'm starving for it. It is a role that needs to be played because it's time to make a difference. Leadership is about making your team, making, making your, your community, making your organization uncomfortable and telling them that we can do better. Because if we do not do that, it's going to be the status quo uh, for a very, very long time. I don't think it would have mattered who was on the ballot. They've done the research. We're trying to get the truth so the public knows what's happening. U.S. District Judge Dan Polster says he's intrigued by what he's calling a novel approach to settling the opioids lawsuit in his courtroom. Attorneys for plaintiffs, including scores of cities and counties, want to form a class now to negotiate a collective settlement against big pharma companies like Purdue and Johnson & Johnson. Usually that doesn't happen until after there's a deal and it's time to divvy up a settlement. We discussed this approach during our weekly Reporters Roundtable. This is about money and also... It always is. It's a, and about power. There's something like 1,900 uh, urban uh, or municipal plaintiffs already involved. There could be 24,000 in total before all this is over. And if, there's, if they have a nemesis in this thing, it might well be the state attorneys general because they want to control who gets how much money and then how it is spent. Right, so you have a little bit of a contest here between the municipal governments, which have actually paid a high share of the cost of the opioid uh, epidemic, and the states. And the lesson of the tobacco settlement is whoever gets to sue gets to get rich. And so you've already heard some of the state AGs making noise about mm -hmm. wanting to preempt local involvement, that, that kind of thing. The other thing you could say is that this, the history of state involvement here has not always been glorious. I mean, Ohio passed a, a law, the legislature did, uh, making it impossible to, well, 
making it extremely difficult to recover damages if one were to sue, for instance, people who made lead products. Right, uh, Congress passed a, a, a bill making it very hard to recover against gun makers. So uh, you could say that it might be an advantage for the pharmaceutical industry to have a smaller crowd of people to lobby and influence. Well, and this this whole proposed structure, it's it's pretty confusing to folks who aren't lawyers. Um, but essentially, it would allow any city or county in the country to participate in negotiating a settlement, voting on a settlement, uh, mm -hmm. you know, divvying up whatever money comes out of it. The state attorneys general are uh, involved in lawsuits against the drug companies, but not in this federal case that's being heard uh, under Dan Polster in Cleveland. They're often in the state courts in those individual states. So they've all got their own individual lawsuits that they're pursuing. Right. Uh, even some, there have been some settlements already. I, I believe Purdue settled uh, claims against them in Oklahoma. So uh, we're starting to see the drug companies uh, begin to pay out settlements. So there's this question of, well, who gets the most money? Who's in charge of dividing it up? Who really has the say in, in how this money is used? Meanwhile, there really has not been a settlement yet in the federal case. There have been settlement discussions, but there's also been trial preparation. And the first trial is scheduled to begin in October of this year when claims by um, Summit and Cuyahoga counties go forward in court. So we could still see this lead to a trial mm -hmm. where these claims are heard out in open court, but it's also possible there could be settlements before then as, as these things are being negotiated uh, behind closed doors with a gag order that prevents people from discussing how far along they really are. Right, Idea Stream's done a lot of coverage. The Plain Dealer has, the State House has done a lot down in the southern part of the state, and yet you just hit the linchpin there. Everything's happening behind closed doors. We don't know mm -hmm. what's happening really. How does this help the people most impacted? Well, what, what happens, I think, as a practical matter, is the threat of public disclosure becomes one of the big levers that pushes people to settle. And so I, I think there's going to be some tension, especially among news organizations like us and the pharmaceutical companies, over whether they're entitled to that secrecy, even if they do settle. My own take as a, as a news person is the public needs to hear the truth, and no settlement should preclude that. As Cleveland prepares to host its first Major League All-Star game in more than 20 years and the sixth in its history, we look this morning to another diamond. 18 miles from Progressive Field, this field of dreams sits just outside the home of the minor league Lake County Captains. Ideastream's Bill O'Connell introduces us to the Miracle League. This just might be the happiest acre in all of Lake County. <laughs> Um. Far from the all-star fanfare and signage sprouting up downtown, the essential simplicity of the game rules. <laughs> Welcome to the Miracle League where children of all abilities can play our national pastime. With the Miracle League, this is a great league for all the kids to come out and for their parents to get a chance to see their kid play on a, on a real baseball field. For a second year, Lake County offers the Miracle League for disabled youth. It's a national program now two decades old, with more than 300 teams across the U.S., Puerto Rico, Canada, and Australia. Thanks to this program, over 200,000 children and young adults with disabilities get their chance to swing for the fences. It's important to come play, huh? Yes, it means a lot. It means a lot to Gives me. you something to look forward to every week. Yep. So before this league, you didn't have a chance to play baseball? It's something you wanted to do before and just couldn't? East Lake's Recreation Department runs the program. The Lake County Captains built this field, the Lake Health Miracle Park, adjacent to Classic Park in East Lake. Its smooth surface gives wheelchair athletes access to a baseball diamond. When the dirt fields, dirt can get into the casters and you want to flip and fall, but this, this field is an anti-latex anti field and it's very, very nice for the chairs and the walkers and the people to run on and the buddies are here to help. Uh, they're here so the parents can just sit and sit in the sit in the stands, watch their son or daughter have that have a smile on their face, cheer. 
Along with the special field, it takes some special friends. The Miracle League works because of volunteers and a system of buddies. Ring it off for the Royals in the top of the first, Sarah Lupo. In this at bat, Sarah's buddy holds the bat as the pitch sails in. After contact, though, it's Sarah who wheels her chair along the path to first base, with her buddy close by for guidance. On defense, buddies help with fielding and throws, but each player contributes to the game as much as physically possible. The help given these players isn't confined to the Miracle League diamond. And this new Miracle League, with the uh, support of the business community, has been a godsend, because a lot of these kids as you can see, wouldn't be able to play on a regular dirt field with raised bases. So this is amazing. It, this this uh, kind of makes the playing field level for everybody. Tim says his son, Tim Jr., loves playing ball and being part of a team. Uh, he's excited. He's excited to come. He's looking at the schedule to see, you know, when the game's going to be. He's, he reminds me, he said, we're playing at noon today, Dad. So uh, he keeps me straight. At this league game, all the parents cheer all the kids. No athlete rides the bench. And over a season, each grows in confidence and self-esteem by doing what they love, playing baseball in a safe, nurturing environment. It's a goal close to the heart of Miracle League general manager, Mike Piper. We are looking to do whatever we can for the families. Um, the way we're set up with the buddies, the way we have a, a playground and we cook food and things of that nature, we're trying to get away from, hey, you come here, you play your game for 45 minutes and you get back in the car. Yeah. What we're looking for is, hey, can we give these families two, three hours out of their day where they, where they can send their kid off with a, their athlete off with a buddy and, and they can relax for a little while, maybe have some lunch after the game, go to the playground, and that way they get two or three hours out of the day for it. Passion and commitment of the players, the city, the contributing sponsors like Lake Health and Lubrizol have created this fledgling league. Eight teams compete this year, up from five last year, and the Miracle League anticipates more expansion in years to come. Of course, having its own facility right by the city's professional stadium really makes an impact. And that sense of belonging, of inclusion, of legitimacy reaches off the field even to the announcer's booth. The mayor of the city of East Lake, Dennis Morley, was promoting the Miracle League, and I asked if I could do the announcing, and he said, absolutely. Matt styles himself after names you know well. Joe Tate, Tom Hamilton, Cleveland royalty behind the microphone. And the ice cream, popsicles, and beverages are courtesy of Pepco, the official refreshment sponsor of the Miracle League. His commitment to be here is like that of the buddies volunteers who understand how important this field is to the community and how important they've each become to their partner athletes. So the biggest thing is if you're going to commit, I understand it's summer Saturdays, we have vacations and you're going to miss from time to time, but if you miss too much, that athlete is looking for you every Saturday morning. The score is never important, not to players, coaches, or parents. The freedom of playing baseball, the celebration of successes large and small, the sights, sounds, and smells of the game, those mean everything. And they should be celebrated. Good game, good game, good game. Before we leave you this morning, we take you inside the Cleveland Museum of Art's signature summer event. To celebrate the change of seasons, CMA transforms from a classic cultural institution to a music-bumping dance party that spills outside to the front steps. Now in its 11th year, CMA's solstice was held last weekend and featured DJs and musical acts from across the globe, along with food, drinks, and special art installations. Ideastream's Mary Fecto takes us inside the party. Solstice is the Cleveland Museum of Art's big annual summer blowout. One night only in the museum where we celebrate the beginning of summer. 
It's a wild and wonderful collision of art with music, fun, sunshine, dancing. We let our hair down for one night and have a great time. We've got two stages going. Bands converge from all over the world to help us celebrate. And everybody comes down here. It's a really nice time in the museum. And we come here every year dressed as the sun and the moon. And, and I, I'm a firm believer in making a costume for $10 or less. This is the one night where we really open up everything, outside, inside, all the galleries, go late into the night. It's a rare opportunity to actually go dancing on the South Terrace under the Thinker on a hot summer night. Uh, we do it all in one night for five hours. It's a marathon and a sprint. The folks who come down here can enjoy music from all the corners of the world. Also, uh, the latest in electronic music and improvised music and some other unclassifiable things. And it's kind of a snapshot of what's going on in the whole global world today. When I came to Solstice tonight, I didn't know what to expect. And what I experienced was community. And we just had such an amazing time tonight, dancing, enjoying walking through the galleries and celebrating what it is the Cleveland Museum of Art has to offer all of us in this community. A lot of museums throw parties, but there's no museum that does anything quite like Solstice. Well, that's going to do it for us for this morning. The State of Ohio with Karen Kassler is up next. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Rick Jackson. Brought to you by Westfield, offering insurance to protect what's yours, grow your business, and achieve your dreams.